So as the talk is on vestibular swanoma, I thought we should read up the book release is on vestibular swanoma. So I thought this would be appropriate for me, me to talk on vestibular swanoma. So I uh, there may not be many neurosurgery uh, students or teachers here. So I don't know whether it will be very much interested for them, but I'm sure this uh, lecture I prepared mostly from the, for the DNB students. So I'm sure the DNB students should be benefited by this uh, talk. Uh, not only everything is available in it, but even we are on olden days people, we like to listen to the talks and read the book as well. So as an introduction, as I said, I will talk mostly on the, I need mean, said to talk on surgical advances and the complications and the complication avoidance, but you know some introductions need to be given. So all of you know that swanoma are benign, usually solitary and capsulated amniotasm that arise from the swan cells of the nerve seed derived from the neurocura. It occurs in over all, all over the body surface, including head and neck region. Occur both in the peripheral cranial nerves or as well as intracranially, and acoustic nerve is most commonly involved. Now, if you go by the epidemiology, the swanoma, vesicular swanoma, the incidence is about 80, 85 90% occurs in the CP angle, and 6%, it is 6% of all intracranial tumors. The incidence in US is about 10 per million per year. I'm sure in this book, of, uh, no, we have our Indian uh, records as well, but I couldn't find any in, in Indian reference as of now. The peak incidence is fourth to sixth decade, and the male and female are normally in equal ratios. 95% of these tumors are sporadic, uh, but 5% are belong to the NF2 group. They are slowly grow, slow growing tumors, average of 1.8 millimeter uh, per year. So it's a very slow growing tumor. As you all know, that the, the acoustic neurinoma is a misnoma. Actual name is vestibular swanoma. This is a historical perspective. You all know, all started. Cushing was the first one who first did a subtotal intracapsular removal. Then they did the first total removal of uh, by suboccipital craniotomy approach, and so on and so forth. The commonest Common presentations are hearing loss 95%, tinnitus 63%, disequilibrium 61%. In trigeminal involvement, 17 percent, facial paralysis, 6 percent, headache, 32 percent, and nausea about vomiting, 9 percent. How do you diagnose? Mostly, the most important thing is by audiometry, where you can go by the hearing loss as well as, as well as by speech discriminations. But the VAR is the most sensitive and the sporadic audiometric test. You can do electrophysiologic testing. Vestibular testing, CT scan. The, the importance of CT scan to get the surgical anatomy of the skull face, especially the vitreous bone. And the gold standard of the investigation is definitely MRI, gadolinium enhanced, both T1 and T2 contrast, and also T2 drives and sequence, where we can get the, the delineation of the nerve as well. Nowadays, by fractional and isotropy, we can even delineate the seventh nerve uh, uh, pre operatively in the MRI. There are various grading systems, but the one which normally we use are the rules classifications. All of them are very simple grade one, grade two, grade three, grade four. Uh, depending on the involvement within the ISC, then outside of the ISC, the tumor occupying the CP angle, the tumor touching the brainstem system or tumor distorting the brainstem system. Now, SAMI has classified brain 3 into uh, two types, 3A and 3B, and brain 4 into 4A and 4B. Now, how do they develop? There has been recent literature saying there are some risk factors involved. Exposure to high doses of ionizing radiation is one of the important factors. Even childhood exposure of to low dose radiation for benign head and neck conditions and exposure even to the desired noise for a long time can in the long term 
can be raised to vestibular trauma. This is an article which is taken from recent uh, European Journal in 2019. Now, regarding the pathogenesis, it's all of course, we know that it's a WHO grade one tumor. The growth rate is less than one millimeter per year. Average KI67 index is very low, 1.86 to 1.99. Malignant degeneration is extremely rare. This is important for neurosurgeon, the displacement of the cranial nerves. So 70% of displacement occurs ventral and ventral superior. So when you operate, we have to know that the displacement that we expect. So most of the displacement are by the ventral or ventral superior. 20% superior, and the, the list is uh, inferior, and very rarely we may have a dorsal displacement as well. The site of origin, we all know the majority is inferior vestibular now 70%, but 20% comes from the superior vestibular now, and even in 10%, it can come from the popular now as well. Origin as the Oberstein Reddit Reddit junction, that is the point of encounter between the central and peripheral myelin, but it can also happen near the porous and posterior. There is a typical variety called medial variety, which origin very close to the meatus. So microscope, macroscopy is a pale capsulated globoid masses displacing or spraying normal structures. Occasional foci of hemorrhage and cystic regenerations are seen. Microscopy will all know the swollen cells arranged in two different tissue patterns. That Antony A, which are dense cellularity, and Antony B, which is sparse cellularity. It induces this important, it induces angiogenesis induced telangiectasia formations, and that causes intratumor to hemorrhage. The one video that I'm going to show you has that it was, it was tremendously vascular. So, this is the reason why some of the Sticks or vestibular swarm ones are very muscular and they have big collagenous capsules. Now, sporadic vestibular shodoma, the commonest thing, they have a myelic inactivation of G, NF2 gene. They are the tumor suppressor gene. It encodes a protein called Murray or Swanui. So it acts as a tumor, suppose, uh, tumor suppressor. And this is the one which the look. The location is in the chromosome 22. And in NF2, they, they have a special mutation in the NF2 gene at position 22, Q12.2. 12, 12 so you can see here, here you can see this. Uh, uh, this is the very one cells here. You can see the one cells. And uh, these are the Antony A cells. And you see the Antony B are very loosely loose pattern, and this is very important. A very classical diagnostic thing in, in Swanoma. I'm sure all the students they, you must see the slide. This is called variety bodies. You see, they are between the uh, you know, they are, they are horizontal rows, you, as you can see here, horizontal rows of palisade nuclei separated by areas of a cellular. So, if you See, these are the one row here, one row here, and this is the cellular area. So this is very important. This is called variable bodies. The presence of this confirms that it's a schwannoma. Now let us come to the management options for which I have been talking today. The surgical options can be surgery, or it can be radio surgery. It can be simple observations or and of course, there's the management of preoperative hydrocephalus as well. Now, the commonest uh, surgical approach is we know retromastoid suboccipital transmetal approach. The most of the acoustic swanoma can be operated by this approach. The middle fossa approach, mostly done by the ENT colleagues for the smaller tumors. There is trans labyrinthine approach. I have some experience on this trans labyrinthine approach as well. Now, important is the position. Any surgery, the most important thing is the position. As a surgeon, we have to give very, very importance to the position. 
because the position is not good, you will he will suffer in the whole study. So for the students, you have to be there right from the beginning of the surgery, and you have to start positioning yourself with your seniors like Professor Bastaban, Professor Ani. So because the lateral or lateral oblique, I'm sure it's called Fukushima position. He only popularized this. It, it, it is, this gives extreme comfort to the surgeon. It gives an excellent visualization of the CT angle system, and it gives a direct visualization of the vessels. It, it's very easy for the tumor removal, and obviously it prevents hypotension and no, no problem about AI involvement. Semi-sitting and sitting, it was popular those days. Earlier days when I was in CMC, my teachers used to do semi, uh, sitting position. Now it has come down to semi-sitting, but still there is chance of air embolism. And supine oblique, I do a lot of my patients in supine oblique position. So I adapt either supine oblique or lateral. So the patient is a little aged, they have got cervical spondylosis, then you should avoid uh, supine oblique position. But both are equal and both are equally equally uh, comfortable for the surgeon. Now you see this is the position I do. I have modified myself a bit because I put the head a little more down, so which is normal uh, thing. So I find it very easy to for a large tumor which is going almost up to the 10 and more anteriorly, this position definitely helps me to get the upper part. See, lower part getting the tumor is not much of a problem. But getting the upper part is most difficult. So this is the vertical, you know, you give a lazy S incision or an inverted J separate incision. One thing you have to definitely keep, it, keep in mind that in uh, there, in case of a hydroplastic vertebral artery on the opposite side, you have to uh, avoid very extreme flexion, and sometimes the domino definitely vertical artery can come. So these are the things for which sometimes you have to do preoperative investigations. The landmark, all of you know, the transverse sinus superiority, sigmoid sinus and transverse sinus junctions is called knee. So that position you have to always expose. If you want to go to the, you know, the depth and the anterior most and superior most part of the tumor, you have to expose that knee. And then, of course, the below is the mastoid growth. And intradural landmark, as you can see, the tentorium superiorly and uh, Pitters go laterally and flat four of the posterior cross up inferiorly. That's all you know. So, what are the surgical steps? The most important is written here, but I will tell you what exactly my experience. I'm sure uh, Professor Gosteman and Professor Anil Pandey uh, would also have told you many times during the surgery. The most important thing is you know the pre operative brain relaxation. You have to see that the brain is lax. If the brain is, lax, is not lax, you have to suffer. So always tell the anesthetic, I, I always put a lumbar drain. I give Panitol about 1 to 1.5 gram per kg of body weight. And uh, depending on the, on the patient's age, of course, and always keep the PCO to low. The so end title should be around 23, 24. That, these are the things. If you do that, then your brain will be absolutely lax. And then when you open, you should always open the dura, first the lower part of the dura to open the cisterna magna. So the first step of the surgery is the cisterna magna opening. That further really lacks the brain. Even then sometimes, I will show you one large tumor, which I'll show you the video. Even then, for after a long time, almost after about 100 pieces of mine, that is the brain was still tight, I had to, you can still do about one centimeter of the lateral part of the uh, cerebellum excision. That doesn't cause any problem to the patients. You know who who, who uh, advocated this for any surgery? It's a Lindsay Simon. You are the British uh, neurosurgeon. So, and then the other important things, uh, he advocated for all the surgeries, for example. Now, the most important thing in the in uh, vestibular sonoma surgery is to maintain the arachnoid plane. The arachnoid will be very thin. It will you will never expect the arachnoid to be a continuous arachnoid. You will see few strands of arachnoid, and you maintain that plane 
try to push the arachno. Now, well, how will it go? You, then, you know, when you are completing the surgery, doing the surgery, you have a superior port, you have an inferior port, you have a medial side, you have a lateral side, and you have a posterior side. And you have a posterior side. When you are operating, you are in the dorsal side, the whole tumor is there, the cerebellum, you have to retract. I normally do not use retractor to the very end. It are very anteriorly because my brain is always very nice. So first, always try to go superiorly because, as is mentioned, because superior you see the arachnoid better, and superior it, it is uh, the delineation is better. The inferior doing the problem is inferior ninth and tenth sometimes will be very, uh, very much adherent. And if you do not debug the tumor and go to the ninth and tenth, you might compromise the ninth and tenth. And may cause problems for the patient, and which is a big morbidity for the patient. So the then of course you have to uh, debulk the tumor. So next thing is a debulking. I always tell my students: I you make a cup and a saucer. You you make a saucer and then debulk it inside uh, to make a cup. As it becomes cup, then you know your capsule is thin. Then you order to retract the, always retract the tumor, never retract the, the, retract the tumor from the cerebellum, not the cerebellum from the tumor. And always remember the best instrument for retraction is the micro scissor. The micro scissor, if you, that helps to really do a very sharp dissection with the micro scissor, you can slowly deliver the tumor from the arachnoid. From the vessels as, and the vessels they peel out by itself along with the arachnoid and along with the cerebellum and so you keep debulking 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 and every time you see how much of your cup is uh, remaining if the the edge of the cup is thick then you debulk some more make it thin when the thin when the cup becomes like this then you remove the uh, remove the Edges of the cup to make it a socket. So again, you uh, pull out the cerebral, pull out the tumor, and again you make like that. You do it as much as possible. And remember, at certain point, you have to decide where you are to drill the internal acoustic meatus. You should not keep the drilling of the internal acoustic meatus till the end, because then what happens? You are losing the lateral boundary, lateral part completely um, you are not touching you are doing you have only three parts to work so at one point when you come you try to you know uh, drill the internal acoustic inter drilling the internal acoustic methods is a must especially if you want to save the seven now and in some occasions definitely eight now if the tumor is small so i will show you the video so uh, this is what Actually, the QSA is definitely a very, very important uh, uh, instrument in this case. And with QSA, the time of surgery definitely comes down. And of course, if you have the navigation, it also helps. People who have, so fortunately, uh, I've been working in this uh, institute and I've been having all these things. So it's use, useful for us. I'm sure uh, now with Anil and Lucidism, Professor Vasudevan will get uh, both QSA and navigation soon. That's what Anil was telling. Yes, I'm sir. sure. QSA is there. QSA, you have got two QSA. So QSA, you have, yeah. So you have got two QSA, but I think you have got a navigation. Now you see, this is one very, very important point for the students. Um, see, uh, where do you identify the facial knot? Always when you are, there are two points where you can identify the facial now. One at the internal auditory meatus and another is the foramen of musca. So always look for the foramen of musca. So if you uh, foramen of you, so you come to the lower part, you come to the foramen of musca because it's very easy to identify because you get the, you see the choroid plexus at the natural part of it. Remember. The seventh now you will be there, seventh now near the foramen of Lusca. And one important, there is a projection of cerebellum called proculus. So, proculus 
is very close to foramen of Lusca and a will put your nerve integrative monitor. That is the other instrument gadget is very, very, very important for acoustics, uh, for vascular sonoma surgery. And so if you put that, you will get the signal. So this is two places you have to identify. So one at the, the uh, internal auditory mantras, other at the level of the foramen of Lusca. So you join this, and then you have to see path, which path they is taking. So this is an anatomy you see how it's seen. It's from the Roxer Rotens fire atlas. Now you see, this is what I was studying. You see how the seventh nerve is. See the choroid plexus, the choroid plexus, and you see the seventh nerve, and you see the proculars. This is a, this is a position which is always constant. So you get the seventh nerve here. So this anatomy, as a student, you have to remember. So this I was telling about this drilling the posterior metal wall and then that all these things. I have seen uh, other people doing. I have, I have seen a lot of uh, you know uh, live surgeries and in the different conferences. People when they drill the internal auditory meter, they drill it very little. No, that's wrong. Actually, the internal, I've seen Professor Sami because I spent some time in Hanover, about three weeks, some time. So, when Professor Sami, I have seen and learned from there, when you drill internal auditory canal, you have to drill very big. It should be white and it should be that, the, you know, the medial lateral depth also should be large. Many times you are scared and you drill it, drill it little bit. That doesn't serve much purpose. So it should be, but it should not be so much because you remember just medial to it, lateral. This lateral to it is the labyrinthine structure. So if you do too much, you will get your injured the labyrinth. So, but we don't need that big. With experience, it comes. How much do I drink? So you see, this is again a book picture. You see the, how the tumor is in relation to the nerve. So, especially when people do middle pass approach, you can see like this, you see the tumor, and so this is the, this is the tumor, and this is the nerve, or nicely seen, and where the tumor is. So, where do you think about subtotal removal? Because this term is coming, and I will come to it my talk later on. Nowadays, uh, we are thinking seriously, I have changed my uh, policy, and as you, as you know, when you are young, you are very energetic, you think of, we do total excision, total excision, total excision was a heroic thing. Uh, but later on, as you become more philosophy, you always try to, you know, think about that I should give, I should not give a little morbidity to the patient. If it's a slight morbidity, you really feel depressed so much. So we all the senior neurosurgeon feel very depressed, we find that we have given a facial to the patient. So that's why this, of course, the you know pendulum is slowly turning that way. Pendulum is turning that you uh, instead of giving the total total excision and giving the patient the seventh nerve or or nowadays even the eighth nerve. So whether you should leave a little bit of tumor, what is called near total removal or a subtotal removal. So where possible. You can give a hearing preservation, and so where there is a very thin seventh nerve, thin nerve, seventh nerve can be flattened and very thin, where there are additions to the tumor, and obviously for the early debilitated patients. So, as I already told, disadvantage of, uh, 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 of the retromastoid approach, it gives a very good exposure, so it's very good for a large tumor. And patient of preservation is possible. Hearing preservation is only see what literature 50 percent in tumor in less than two centimeters. So it is not a big deal to you know for hearing preservation of less than two centimeter tumor, but the literature doesn't show about the patient of hearing preservation for a large tumor. So I, I've heard a lot of lectures, people the most that they have even said the Eighth nerve, uh, I'm sure Professor Bhaskaran will agree with me that you have to you know, accept that with a little pinch of salt. 
So hearing preservation for a large tumor is very difficult. But there are disadvantages. There are poor exposure to the to the end of the uh, internal auditory canal because if you drill, if you drill the internal auditory canal less, then the lateral end you may not get that much. And yes, as I was telling you, very large tumor needs a severe retraction. There is always a possibility of CSF leak, and you know that the CSF leak there, and that, that the headache is a problem of retromastoid. A lot of patients complain of post op headache later on. So what are the complications? All of we know the complications are of various cranial nerves. There can be fifth, seven, eight lower cranial nerves. So eight nerve paresis, seven nerve paresis, all these uh, different procedures are there by which uh, it can be taken care of. Lower cranial nerves, again, we have to give uh, temporary rise to feed or a feeling gastrostomy. Hydrocephalus need to be ruled out always. If there is a leak, then you have to rule out. If there is a patient is developing a hydrocephalus, you have to put a temporary LP drill. If there is a CSA or autorhinodia, or if there is meningitis, wound infection, and postoperative hematoma, these are the complications which can happen in a retromastoid case. So, how do we avoid these complications? So, eight nerve dysfunctions definitely the intra VAR. Nowadays, we do intra VAR for all of, all of our acoustics. I have a very good, very experienced uh, neurophysiologist, and he has is he has got a lot of new gadgets now. We have, we have started operating, we have started monitoring all the Kenyan now, lower Kenyan now, and even the uh, patient EMG, and we are doing the continuous intra VAR as well. So then, uh, so intra VAR is very important. Seven now this. Uh, Dysfunctions, all of you know, intraoperative monitoring, intraoperative monitoring, uh, you have called, uh, you know, like uh, nerve integrity monitor, and you have to identify the nerve. And also, nowadays, the uh, facial nerve EMGs are available. So, facial nerve uh, monitoring is much more simpler than eight nerve monitoring. There are fifth nerve. Even the fifth nerve monitor is available nowadays, and lower lower cranial nerves, as I was telling in the surgical step, I, I missed one point. After you debug the tumor to a certain extent, first and foremost thing you have to do when you are like when you know that uh, the brain is a little lax, lift up the tumor, secure the lower cranial nerves, and put some gel foam or some surgical cell so that the eighth nerve. Uh, Lower cranial nerves are safe because lower cranial nerve is something which can give rise to a significant morbidity to the patient, uh, including tracheostomy, infections, and death. Injury to uh, you know, AICA is uh, rather very, very uncommon. I did not have a single case because if you, uh, if you push the arachnoid valve, you don't even know, see the nerve. See the artery uh, till the end. CSF or uh, autonia again we have discussed the cerebellar swelling, that is a very important thing for which your for a large tumor, the adequate size of the craniotomy is very important. CSF to be released from the cistern and magna, as I told. And but if, even if you put the retractor, you have to periodically release the retractor and put it again. And if there is a significant uh, swelling. Then you don't put the bone back, and of course, you have to give lasix and manidol post operative. For the CSF leak from the wound, how to avoid you have to do a little closer, then the incision should be sharp, careful handling of the wound edges, and meticulous closer, and strict antisepsis measure. So, middle first approach, I'm not going to it because though I've done for other tumor, but I'm not done for acoustic because I don't think it is necessary. So, as all of you know about the Kawasaki approach, it is a little shorter than Kawasaki approach. Extension of middle fossa is the Kawasaki approach. If you go anterior, basically you have to uh, drill the arcuate eminence and you get into the labyrinthine system and then you can. Uh, go to the arcuate eminence and from there to the uh, 
to the Kawasis approach, and you can get into that. So I'm not going into that. Uh, but it is remember it is applicable only for a small tumor, tumor less than 1.5 centimeter. Nowadays, because of the you know the radio surgery is available, we don't operate this type of small tumors. Translaven thing, I have got experience of about 10 cases. Initially, I was very enthusiastic, and I have all of you know Dr. Rafa is there, so it's very enthusiastic. But in the earlier time, we started doing few of the translab approach uh, in uh, 2000 to 2007, 8, like that time. So we have done about 10 cases just to have an experience. It's a very good approach, especially for the patient who doesn't have a serviceable hear, uh, hearing. So these cases you can do, even though it's written up 2.5 centimeter, you can even do a larger tumor as well. But remember, it's only for the patient who, whose hearing function is already lost. So the advantage is quite good because you have an early identification of the patient now. So the chance of uh, saving the patient now is much higher for a translabyrinthian approach. Because, and it's a direct approach to CP angle. You are seeing the right, right, you are right. First, you are seeing the internal auditory canal. So from there, you can go to the intercranial part. So once you, uh, once you, and that's that's quite a good amount of exposure. And the tumor makes your way. So once you remove the uh, internal auditory canal tumor, then you can remove the uh, CP angle tumor as well. Uh, if the tumor is very large, you can add on small amount of uh, pre-sigmoid, you know, retrolab approach also to get into that. So this is the thing, basically it's a, it's called Trotman's angle, you know, what is that? It's a boundary between the, the set sigmoid sinus, jugular, bulb, and superior pectoral sinus. So this is the triangle, you see that? So that is the area which you have to work. And this is the incision, and you do a complete mastoidectomy. Then you go, then you get into the labyrinth end, do a labyrinth end, a labyrinthectomy, do the first lateral, you know, lateral semicircular canal. It continues at the facial now, as you can see it here. Here, this is the Belovian canal. So, uh, this is the superior, superior vestibular. This is a semicircular canal. This is the posterior, and this is the lateral. So then the next one is the deeper part of it. You keep doing it. You take the bony labyrinth and then come to the membranous labyrinth. You see that all the three semicircular canals are exposed. And this is a book picture, and this is operating photo. You can see that superior semicircular canal. The uh, the lateral and this is the posterior and this is the place called subarcuate artery and now you keep drilling it till you now you see this is the this is the uh, this is the uh, this is the fallopian canal this fallopian canal you all of you know that you know the Labyrinth is part of the facial nerve. It gives it gives a almost 120 degree turn in an acute angle come to the internal auditory canal. And at the junction is the GSPA. So when you come to the middle force approach, you get into the GSPA first. And here we are getting into the uh, the Peruvian part, of the labyrinth part of the facial canal. Facial nerve is not passed. You get into the GSPA. You cut the GSPN and you get into the internal artery canal. So this is the internal artery canal, as you can see. So this is the internal artery canal. This, this is the fallopian canal. So here is the internal artery canal. So here you see that you see that after the labyrinth has been totally uh, dissected out, you see that this is the uh, labyrinth part. And this is this is the uh, this 
that is the uh, city angle, that is the area where the uh, internal artery can run. And now you see, you can see the in the book picture, you can see how it is where the uh, superior vestibular nerve is. There you can see here also, the next part you can see. You can see here the dura is opened here, and you see the tumor as well as the patient. Now you see how nicely the patient has seen here. The patient has seen very well. And you can remove, you can excise the tumor from the facial nerve. So that's the reason you can get access to this facial nerve in the beginning itself. So chance of uh, chance of facial nerve uh, uh, saving is much much higher in this case. Obviously, for a very large tumor, it's not that suitable. For moderate size, like up to three centimeter and all, this can be done very well. You see, this is one case. You can see that. Is a moderate size about 3.5 centimeter is an ideal part. This could have been easily done by the red from but as you said, we were trying to develop that, so we have done that those days. Is another one. So this is the you know, algorithm for acoustic tumor. Less than more than 2.5 centimeter, there is no doubt suboccipital damage. Less than 2.5 centimeter, the patient has hearing. Preservation. If there is no hearing preservation, you can do translab approach. If then more than less than one centimeter, you do a middle process. If hearing preservation is there, if the tumor, you can go well suboccipital. So this is a very simple algorithm we follow it for the. But for us, most of the tumor can be approached with a reflusive model approach. Smaller tumor nowadays. Are treated by radio surgery. So, facial nerve preservation, as I said, the EFG monitoring is very important. But either you can do continuous EFG monitoring, and of course, you can do use a nerve integrity monitor. Sometimes there may be delayed facial weakness because of the edema inflammation, usually complete over the first six months. But exact outcome of the patient now, whether the patient now, what grade it is, you know, after one year. So I always tell the patients, that, okay, you wait for one year, it may come back. So a lot of my patients I have seen that they, they come back to almost grade five, grade, uh, I mean, grade one or grade two at the end of one year. So for hearing, hearing preservations, BAER, the most important nowadays also, uh, electrocorticography also is being done and the direct recording of, of CNA. So technical as Janeta has given a few uh, points for avoiding patient of nerve injury. He said elevate cerebral lump, avoid medial retraction. So he said not to do medial retraction early and shove the section with all of us know. And then the sterling scissors a very good instrument and alternate direct dissections, all directions, the pressure even small vessels that you have to preserve even the small vessels which are going to the ISC. Because we don't know which one the internal artery are. So, hearing preservation is good hearing preservation possible if the tumor is small, good preoperative hearing is there, lack of lateral tumor extension to fundus. Because gone way up to the fundus and it's difficult. Poor, if sudden intraoperative loss of potential, if the poor, 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 intraoperative presence of several, several additions between nerve and tumor, and it's an imagined factor. So let's come to the conservative management. In conservative, what we call as a wait and watch policy. So we have to do a second radiological examinations on every six months, patient has to be seen by radiological investigations. If the tumor grows about two to three millimeter in the first year, then it definitely likely to intervene. So when, which are the cases we think about conservative management? If the age is advanced, if there is patient has a short life expectancy, less than 10 years, poor general condition of the patient, small tumor is minimal or no symptoms, especially intracanalicular tumor, tumor only or in the better hearing year in NF2 tumors and patient's preference, of course. Co contraindication that's very important for us, young patients, healthy patients, Symptomatic progression and compression to brainstem structures. 
So this is very, very important. So we should not just say for all, everybody has wait and watch policy. A disadvantage is what risk of hearing loss given in non-growing tumor, because one of the most important cause of a hearing loss is the continuous pressure on the nerve. Loss of patients, uh, lack, loss of patients compliance and chance of hearing preservation better in cases of short symptoms, short symptom duration. Quality of life, what happens after a vestibular coronary surgery? So what are the factors? Factors definitely hearing loss, facial paresis, post-operative ataxia, dyscosia. There is an uh, article by uh, Professor Sanjay Bihari, I will come to that. We, we, uh, the significant number of patients complete of uh, lo loss of test sensation, the post-operative headache is another important symptoms. Then 33% required post-operative home health, significant number. In suboccipital surgery, poor patient nerve functions, more reports of pain and incapacity to work. In translab approach, larger the tumor, more number of patients unfit to work, more severe pain and post-operative vertigo. Facial paralysis, 45.5% experience worsen physical facial weakness caused by surgery, and of this, 72% reported that it was permanent. 28% felt significantly affected, uh, significantly affected by facial weakness, 28%. The factor most often associated with poor outcome was a large tumor. Major effect is on the psychological area with increased rates of emotional distress and impaired social functioning. Test dysfunction. This was from Sanjay Gandhi Institute of Medical Sciences. Here they have done on 142 patients. Pre op decreased sensation was on 40.8%. Sensory disturbance was 33 to 45%. Post op disturbance was on 45.8%. But out of that 6.9%, the test improved. So, what was the conclusion? As this usia must be included in pre op counseling. We should counsel the patient that you can have a loss of tests and anterior to part of the test sensations. Then it, it should be included in special nerve function assessment. Role of radio surgery. I'll just say one few lines on it. It's, it is given for the tumors which are less than two centimeters in older patients. Patient, if the patient is decision making, and if the patient has got a functional hearing, so we can think about radio surgery for smaller tumor, especially schools uh, one and two grade. And nowadays, the dose has been reduced. Right? Previously, we used to give in the earlier days. I was very much involved with radio surgery in uh, in uh, specialty. They used to give very high dose. They used to give 18 grade. Then slowly, slowly come down. Now the standard dose is 12 to 13 grade. 12 to 13 grade has got a very good uh, tumor control, and you know the patient has got a good patient uh, outcome as well as the hearing. Actually, I have a very good photo, but I forgot to include it. The tumor for six months is so it's not sudden, that will increase, then it gradually comes down. So, the management decision here, as I told, the intracanalicular tumor less than five millimeter. We have to always think whether we are dealing with a hemangioma as well. They are usually asymptomatic, so observation is the thing you can do between 5 to 10 millimeter. You can think of uh, galvanite or cyanide, but if patients wishes want surgery, then middle for symptoms. If the tumor is 10 to 25 millimeter, then you do, uh, you can give both. You can do galvanite or cyanide, and you can do surgery also. But if more than 25 to 25 millimeter, uh, definitely. The surgery is the only treatment, and plus minus uh, gamma if needed. So these are the problems I've already told. The rehabilitation is very important. Facial reanimation nowadays, uh, a lot of plastic surgeons are doing it. And hypoglossal facial anastomosis, muscle transposition, hearing rehabilitations, uh, and here the cochlear implantation is being done. So lower cranial nerve rehabilitation and psychological counsel. So there are a few recent advances for the juniors to know. There is something called adaptive hybrid surgery. 
what they do is the pre-operative itself the uh, they draw uh, the dose planning the dose for the how much the rate they, they plan that will do a subtotal excision and uh, they draw it in the uh, in the in the radio surgery console okay i will leave about 10 percent of tumor and they draw the tumor that person and that 10 percent they draw the graph and during surgery they uh, they keep some monitor there during surgery they go up to that and then they the radio radiation oncologists come to the theater and they monitor it and they give the radio surgery there itself so a VTI based fiber tracking is uh, very important as I was telling and I have fractional vaccination and isotropy can delineate the patient now uh, from the uh, from the tumor or from the arachnoid also so and now to Fukushima technique now Fukushima has been operating on half leg like we do in a spinal surgery you know the opposite side uh, 180 degree microscope both have got 3D monitor and both surgeons operating. So it is like our endoscopies, uh, two surgeons for and technique. So he's been operating and he has the literature which he found is very, uh, very nice. Apparently he's very happy. Apparently the uh, outcome is much better. So of course, uh, it's, uh, there's a very good uh, 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 technique, but uh, we have to see how, how it's helpful for us because we are all used to operate as a single person. Then uh, this is um, this is a laser. I'm sure I think Dr. Manas has acquired this uh, laser. It's called Tulia laser. This is very very advantageous for tumor debulking. The advantage of that it does not affect tissue more than three millimeter from the tip of the fiber, and tissue damage is limited to 0.2 to 0.1 millimeter. Papaverin and cranial nerve for cranial nerve preservations. I also started using this. There has been role of aspirin has been found that in minimizing the sporadic vestibular swanoma growth in vivo, and role of diversity for for especially for NF2 tumors. Now there is a you all the juniors should see these guidelines. There is a big uh, CNS uh, vestibular swanoma guideline in 2018. There are outing questions almost some. 100 questions. I have taken very few points in it for you to know because I saw this forum. It will be very useful for all of you to know these guidelines. So they have put questions and there is some are level two step, uh, 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 some are level three step. So first is a vein is screening with MRI recommended in adults with asymmetric uh, vestibular uh, sensory neural bearing loss on audiometry. So what is the answer is recommendation is if there is more than 10 decibel of intraoral differences at two or more contiguous frequencies or more than 15 decibel and the first one frequency itself, this patient should be uh, screened for the MRI. If it is less, you don't need to screen them for MRI. What sequence should be obtained on an MRI? We will have a vestibular swanoma before and after surgery. What is the recommendation for detection of small tumors, high resolution T2 and T1 contrast, and post op should be done with post contrast CD. Sequences and nodular enhancement is considered suspicious of recurrence. Then, another recommendation on the same T2 drive sequences can help in visualizing a patient now pre op that was telling. In patients where wait and watch policy is being pursued, MRI should be done annually for five years and interval increases uh, after that. Do cystic vestibular schwannoma differ from solid tumors? Yes. Patients with cystic schwannoma should be counseled that their tumors can have a rapid growth, lower rate of complete resection, and facial nerve outcomes that may be inferior in the immediate post op period, but similar to non-cystic tumors in the long run. What is the overall probability of maintaining serviceable hearing following stereotactic radio surgery at two, five, and 10 years? More than 50 to 70% at two years, 50 to 75% at five years, 25 to 50% at 10 years. What surgical approaches for vestibular schwannoma are best 
for complete resection and facial nerve preservation when serviceable hearing is present. There is insufficient evidence to support the superiority of either the middle fossa or the retrosigma approach for complete vestibular sonoma resection and facial nerve preservation when serviceable hearing is present. This serviceable pre preservation routinely possible with vestibular schwannoma surgical resection when serviceable hearing is present. Level three recommendation hearing preservation surgery via middle fossa approach or the retro sigmoid approach may be attempted in patients with small tumor size less than 1.5 centimeter and good free of hearing. There is subtotal surgical resection of vestibular schwannoma followed by stereotactic radio surgery to the residual tumor, provide complete hearing and facial nerve preservation to patients who undergo a complete surgical resection. There is insufficient evidence to support. Thus, surgical resection of vestibular schwannoma treat preoperative trigeminal neuralgia more effectively than SRS. Surgical resection of vestibular schwannoma may be used to better relieve symptoms of trigeminal neuralgia than than SRS. This is a very important point. And uh, yes, we can give radio surgery uh, as well, especially, especially applicable for trigeminal uh, neuronoma. Small trigeminal neuronoma, many times we think that uh, no, we can give SRS, but surgery has got a better outcome. Is surgical resection of vestibular schwannoma more difficult after initial treatment with SRS? If my, microsurgical resection is necessary after SRS, it is recommended that patients be counseled that there is increased likelihood of SS of resection and decreased facial nerve function. During intraoperative testing, we largely predict poor long term facial nerve function. Poor intraoperative EMG electrical response of the facial nerve should not be used as a reliable predictor. So they can be, you know, false negative of poor long-term facial nerve function. Could intraoperatively eight nerve monitoring be used during vestibular schwannoma surgery? Intraoperative eight cranial nerve monitoring should be used during vestibular schwannoma surgery when hearing preservation is attempted. So let me tell about my thoughts. In the next few slides, I will end by giving my thoughts. Uh, I've given you this quote from Majid Sami. So he has given this quote after so many surgeries that he saw a challenge that the acoustic vestibular schwannoma, a challenge the cranial nerve deficit, morbidity, mortality, and significantly more. So in his 25 years, he has seen that he has tried, tried radical excision even in these tumors, but off late. I have been a bit conservative in selected cases. This is a quote from Professor Majid Sami, who is supposed to be the father of acoustic neuronoma surgery. So, my thought after exactly 25 years of experience, because I started doing 1989 as an uh, independent surgeon uh, in CMC Velour, so uh, it echoed the same approach. From 89 to 2014, after doing about 610 cases, I have also become more prudent in my next 98 cases till death. But is there any, what I started thinking, is there any point of giving the patient a patient nerve deficit by doing a total excision, even if I could keep the anatomical integrity of patient nerve for at least 50% of cases? If not, does a deliberate subtotal or near total excision give the patient a better neurological and overall outcome? So from 2015 till death, I have operated about 98 cases, out of which 80 were either large or giant vestibular schwannoma. I'm sure here in VHS also, you are all getting large or giant vestibular schwannoma because we don't get that many small here, unlike Western countries. In 45 cases, anatomical preservation of patient nerve could be achieved, but 50% of them had grade 2, grade 4 uh, patient nerve deficit. In remaining 50%, it was grade 1. In the remaining cases, either STR or NTR were done, resulting in no patient nerve deficit. Unfortunately, none of these giant uh, tumors 
had any serviceable hearing uh, preservation, uh, free operative rate cell. So, what does Majid Sami says again? The focus in vestibular sonoma surgery has long been shifted from a life saving operation to, the, to that of a functional and cosmetic recovery. In Sami and Mathai's, sorry for the spelling, Mathai series, complete resection carried out in 97.9% deliberate subtotal resection in 2.1%. So my surgical strategies, free of identification of the patient now be possible with large CT animal using high density digital interoperative patient nerve monitoring, neuro navigation, this is the And this is the way you use the NIM when you are in the tumor, high tumor volume to start with the bigger milliampere and then gradually come and then you, you know how much tumor you have excited and how much tumor is left, which is attached to the patient now. And you see that in how it works. So. So you can delineate the patient now, depending on the depth of the tumor, you can reduce the medium depth. So we can draw the patient now there, so you know where or where you can do, you can totally excite the tumor and when you can be ready to be tumor. This is again the NIM an interoperative picture. And this is the neuro navigation. At each depth, you can uh, check how much you have removed. And as you know, small and medium sized vestibular tumor, there is no confusion. It should be surgery as a primary mortality. A primary modality, but for a large and giant vestibular sonoma, the strategy strategy has to be delineated very clearly. The total excision and preserving facial plus minus auditory function that should be the goal. So wherever you can remove completely, then you remove, but otherwise give a near total or subtotal resection, and either you follow up the patients or subject them to gamma nine or cyber nine. So a judicious decision needs to be taken, especially if the patient is young age. And in India, it's very important if it's for a non-married female, because if a if a young girl get, you know, goes back with a patient of deficit, definitely she is not going to get married. So that's very very important for us to make a decision. Elderly patients more than 70 years, it is really not necessary to change the tumor completely. High risk patients again. But for middle aged patients who have a long life expectancy, extent of resection should be balanced, keeping in mind the chance of recurrence for STR. So, proper in those cases, the proper counseling with the related patients is necessary. Chance of developing patient of deficit in case of gross total resection for subtotal resection, the patient needs radio surgery. Yes, so, there are a few articles again which tells the same thing. The large acoustic tumors, the ST, STR radio surgery is one of the options. These are the same things it tells about that. There's a lack of time, and just skipping those. Again, the same thing. They all say that you no know, subtotal excision followed by radio surgery must be the goal nowadays is for, for to avoid giving patients of deficit. These are the few. This is a case I operated recently, and I have this video. I, and this one fortunately so happened after Anil said I didn't have a good video and I, I had one video and I, I just totally missed it. I don't know my one hard disk is totally missing and my it dropped uh, one good post of video was there. I didn't get it. Fortunately, this patient came and I took the video. So this is a very large tumor as you can see and it's a very vascular tumor. You see the patient doesn't have any deficit and no patient have deficit. And you see the tumor has been excised completely near total. I just left a small tumor, maybe less than one millimeter on the patient now. 
Here I can show you how you can eliminate the facial nerve. So this is the The last thing. See the tumor. It's a very large tumor. So, and very vascular. Here's the position I use. This is a uh, uh, the the So, the bone has been lifted up, as I was telling. That you have to open the cisterna magna. So then the cerebellum here I removed a little bit of shape from just about two centimeters. Now you see the tumor and see through that. So you have to have all sorts of bipolar. Anita said that you have got plenty of bipolar here. We don't have that many. After you make a, you know, you see this is a cup. After you make a cup, you put some gel ball and then they use the use the scissor to delineate the tumor. So it's very vascular. You see that? You see, I am continuously using the scissors and taking the tumor. Uh, a lot of people say that you don't use the bipolar at all, but for a vascular tumor, you have to use. You have to decide. The tumor is not vascular, you don't have to. But if you use the bipolar on the tumor, nothing happens. You see, I'm gradually taking the capsule out, and most of the time I'm using the scissors and rotor. If the lower cranial nerves, you see, and I've taken the fragment from the lower cranial nerves, and I have kept one. This is the duro over the internal auditory canal, and I always keep you know, the thick on uh, that uh, cover. To protect the dura because that doesn't uh, come in your drill. So you drill the. You see the width of. The knee. And you see this is the tumor. You will see the patient now soon here. There. This is a superior petrosal vein. It's a very large vein. Always try to preserve it, never coagulate it, because in some cases you can get into problems. Do skiusha, debulk the tumor. Every time you have to thin the tumor and keep the right nerve. You see, there are fifth nerve here. As I said, if you go superior, the fifth nerve is very flat. This is the ninth and tenth. Okay. So that the seventh now again. Every time I'm seeing that. Yeah, how much I have gone? All the time the neural navigation and now we have a uh, no integration, so we can see in the lens itself how much we have removed the tumor. Cusa is always, always very helpful. You see the arachnoid, you keep that arachnoid and debug the tumor. You have to always see where exactly the patient is. Now, see, I have, I have delineated the whole patient passage. I know where it is going. Right from the internal acoustic matters, the patient nerve there, there's the seventh nerve superiorly, and there's the patient nerve. This is, this is the 
the title. Have to say is I had one read from the Paika, one of the dances from the Paika. Sometimes you can use the meme itself to dissect. So that you know exactly where it's going. The dips itself tells that I almost that you would assume. This is the papaverin I was telling because of that vessel I had to use papaverin. And this is a small tumor. We have got trigeminal you know, monitoring, the patient now monitoring, and the work you know, monitoring as well. This is a post toxicity and uh, Exercise. These are the few uh, cases. This is a patient with a recurrent uh, swanoma, which has operated elsewhere, came with the patient now, and I had operated long back. And my steward is another girl. She now has grade two deficit. This is again recently, last year I operated here, this girl from Lucknow. She has, you see, this is a total. I her six months ago, she has had come and she has had radio surgery. And this is another girl with a very big tumor. In fact, this I operated about uh, 10 years ago. This was going across the midline. So I, I did, a, I myself uh, thought that let me go for suboccipital. I went suboccipital, removed that. Suboccipital by uh, intraaxial approach and then go laterally and took the tumor out, and she's got no patient. The tumor was very large. Another baby, another young girl, I left this much of tumors. These are all recent after my another young boy. These are all old photos. I don't have a clinical picture. So in conclusion, that very important this is note, the capacity to smile and hear is a current focus of therapy. A saving life has become easier with multiple patient-centric and tailored resection. Patient must be comfortable with the concept of tumor control rather than tumor removal. Surgeons should strive to educate their patient with the information from the peer review journal. So if I tell, for example, patients come to the OP, you say, now we do a partial infection or we do a subcutal resection, patient might think, oh, the doctor is saying, can't remove the tumor. So if you tell them, okay, show them to your literature, you say that what the recent literature is saying, they will understand that. So that is what it said. It's very important for them also to educate with, uh, with the literature. Our comments on Extent of resection and gamma-knife radiosurgery should not be based on me, conjecture, training bias, or socioeconomic uh, concerns. As a surgeon, we should be absolutely certain that a total excision of tumor will not produce any neurological deficit. If we are comfortable, we can go ahead with total excision. If not, subtotal resection with adjuvant radiosurgery should be the goal as it gives an excellent tumor control without any additional neurological deficit. Thank you very much for the patient's hearing.